We've learned a tremendous amount about the universe in the last hundred years, and we've learned that it did have a beginning in the Big Bang, but we don't know how to describe the laws of physics all the way back to t equals zero. And it's fine not to know. Not knowing is a, is a good thing. It's something physicists and scientists in general like, uh, because it means there's st still things to learn. We can take the universe back to the earliest moments after the Big Bang, and we think, in fact, it, it, after the Big Bang, bang there was an immense period of expansion called inflation. But one of the things that people like myself and others get paid to do is think about perhaps how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, the two main theories of the early part of the 20th century. And until we have a theory that unifies them, we will simply not know how things began at t equals zero. We can imagine plausibility arguments, and I wrote a whole book to demonstrate that based on everything we know now, it's quite plausible that our universe sprang into being spontaneously by a quantum fluctuation and literally came into something from nothing. The question of how we get something from nothing, of course, has been around for as long as people have thought about the universe and thought that it might have a beginning. One of the arguments traditionally is that God is needed to do it. But one of the wonderful things is we've discovered that's not necessary. That in fact, gravity can have negative energy as well as positive energy. And therefore, you can start with zero total energy, which is what the state of nothing we would expect is, and create a universe which has 100 billion galaxies and 100 billion stars and still have zero total energy. In fact, if you asked, what would a universe look like that came from nothing spontaneously by quantum mechanics, it would look identical to the universe in which we live. Does that prove that's the case? No, but it makes it highly plausible. A lot of people say, well, science will never be able to answer this question or that question. But in fact, we don't know until we try. So far, there's been no barriers. And so I hope that one day we will be able to answer the question, how did the universe begin? And maybe even, is our universe unique? Uh, but I don't know. And the only thing we can do is keep trying. And uh, it's a very exciting time because every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised and we learn more. This notion that the universe appears fine-tuned for life, first of all, is actually a misrepresentation. The universe is not really fine-tuned for life in most places. Most of the universe is quite harsh. And in fact, the universe is trying to kill us almost every day. It's amazing that life has survived this long on Earth. So the universe as a whole is, in fact, not fine-tuned for life. But beyond that, the fact that the conditions here on Earth uh, appear to be just right for life is more a representation of the fact that, that life evolved appropriate to the conditions on Earth. Just like it's the illusion of design, going back to Darwin. Just like it looks like bees are designed to be able to find flowers of a certain color, the point is if they didn't, they wouldn't reproduce. We happen to exist in a universe with certain characteristics, and what that demonstrates is that we can exist in a universe with those characteristics. If the characteristics had been different, we wouldn't be around. So if you wish, it's a kind of cosmic natural selection, which I'll talk about in a lecture here tonight, that we find ourselves living in the universe in which we can live. It would be really amazing to find ourselves in a universe in which we couldn't live, and that would also probably be worth a new book. But no one would be around to read it. It, it is true that certain parameters of the, of the universe appear to be such that if you change them a little bit, life wouldn't be possible. Does that represent prime tuning? Not necessarily. For example, Certain of those parameters could be changed, that, that look very weird in order for us to be around, could be changed and in fact the universe would be better fit for life. One of the main ones that is often talked about is the energy of any empty space. If it were much greater, there wouldn't be galaxies and there wouldn't be people. So people say, oh, it's fine-tuned to be just the value it is. But in fact, if it were precisely zero, which from a physics perspective is much more natural, in fact, the universe would be a better place for life in the long term. But beyond that, it's quite possible that our universe isn't even unique and that the laws of physics vary in different universes. And then once again, we'd only expect to find ourselves in a universe which had conditions appropriate for our existence. In other universes, we wouldn't exist, and therefore it wouldn't be a surprise that the universe appears to have parameters which are, which are just right for us. But even then, even if that's not the case, the question is, 
life exists of a certain form, and, and, and here on Earth we, are, we're, we use water and organic materials, but we don't know what the total possibilities are for life. It could be that life can take many different forms, and therefore we could ask the question, if the parameters of the universe were different, we wouldn't exist, but could it be possible that life of another sort could exist? And the answer is we don't know. And so it's not at all obvious that, that, uh, that the universe has to be the way it is for life to exist. Uh, it has to be the way it is for us to exist. But once again, we evolved in that universe. We are fine-tuned to the universe. The universe isn't fine-tuned for us. As a scientist, I don't like to use the word believe. Believe is not really a good word. In science, things are either likely or unlikely. And as a scientist, uh, things that seem likely are things that uh, are most likely true. Things that are extremely unlikely could be true, but one should be skeptical. So in fact, skepticism is a key part of, of looking at the universe as a scientist. And uh, I, what I most important, if I want to use the word believe, is that I force my beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. And that means I'm totally willing to change what I believe as I learn more about the universe. That's what's wonderful about science. Our views evolve, as I'll talk about here tonight, unlike religion, where you assume the answers before you even ask the questions. Who knows what question science can answer? Once again, we, we don't know until we try. Some things seem like science will never be able to answer them. People once thought we wouldn't be able to learn about the universe beyond Earth. We certainly have. Will we ever understand love? Will we ever understand many things that, that seem, consciousness, for example, that seem right now mystifying? The answer is, we don't know. There are no inherent limits on science as far as we can see. Maybe one day there will be, but we won't know unless we try. Science, in fact, is not based on certain truth. So what science can do very well is to, to prove things false. So we can say certain things are false with certainty if they violate the results of experiments. If an idea violates the, makes predictions that disagree with experiment, it's false. So what's false, in some sense, remains that way forever. And we can say what's false with certainty. But what's true, we can't say with certainty. Because even an idea that works, like Newton's theory of gravity, can later on be refined at the, at the extremes of scale. So our ideas continually change, and we have to keep testing them. So scientists don't mind living with uncertainty. In fact, it's exciting, because once again, it means there's more to learn about the universe. Well, science is done by humans, and, and we should remember that scientists are human. It's often easy to forget that fact. And therefore, scientists have inherent biases and things that they think are true, and they're often willing to give up, will, or not so willing to give up their ideas easily. And so uh, science, has science has followed various lines of thought that have been red herrings over time. But what's great is while scientists are biased, science itself isn't. Science is designed to overcome those biases. And as Max Planck once said, science progresses one funeral at a time. People often say to me, well, science is like religion because you have to have faith. The only thing I have to have faith in, in some sense, is that there's an objective reality. But if there isn't, then there's, what's the point of even asking any questions? But scientists don't have faith because that the world is the way they think it is, which is what religion is based on, because we continually go out and try and test that idea. As Richard Feynman once said, science, if you have an idea, if you're a scientist, you try and prove it right, but you try equally hard to prove it wrong. So often we're trying to prove ourselves wrong, and that certainly isn't the same kind of faith as religion. For me to live without certainty is exciting, because it means I can be surprised at every turn. In fact, it makes life more exciting and more worth living that I don't know everything. If you did, it would be kind of a boring existence. Well. As my friend Steven Weinberg, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist and an atheist, has said that most scientists don't think enough about God to even know if they're atheists. Because in our descriptions of reality, God never enters. Science has made, indeed, God redundant. Now, as far as the general idea of could the universe have been created with some purpose that we don't understand, well, it's, it's really hard to disprove that idea. But when it comes to the world's major religions, they are incompatible with science. Their tenets 
each of them disagree with things we've learned about the universe. And after all, most of them were created by Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. So why would one expect them to be correct? Science is important because we're all scientists. We're all born scientists. We, 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 we evolve and we, we, we adapt, I should say, rather than evolve. As young babies, we're learning about the world. We're constantly testing our ideas, if a fire is hot or not. And that's really the scientific process. Science is essential to learn about the world and to learn about ourselves. If we want to answer those transcendental questions like, are we alone? Where do we come from? What does it mean to be human? Ultimately, we need science. There's no, no knowledge comes from revelation. It only comes from empirical study of the universe followed by reasoning. And that's what I describe as science. Science is fun. We are hardwired to love to solve puzzles. And science is one great puzzle. Science enhances our lives just as music, art, and literature do by changing our perspective of our place in the cosmos. The aha experience that you have when you learn something new or you understand something you never understood before is orgasmic. Science is fun. And in fact, I think most children know that. The problem with many schools is we take the fun out of science. Part of the fun is asking questions. And I think we have to understand that in our schools we need to spend more time asking questions and less time worrying about facts. Science has made the world around us possible. It's, it's, it's improved the lot of most people on Earth by, its, by the technological developments that have resulted from science. People live longer, and more people can live without starvation and without pain. So science has improved our lives immeasurably because of its technology, but it's not just because of that. It's because science has improved our understanding of ourselves. It's helped us understand what it means to be human. It's an essential part of civilization. And without science, then the joy of being human is diminished. You know, I've been called a militant atheist, and it always amuses me. Uh, I don't know what a militant atheist does. Uh, uh, but m more importantly, in our society, if you simply question whether God exists publicly, you're called a militant atheist. But surely we want to encourage questioning, open questioning of everything. In a healthy society, nothing should be sacred. No idea should be beyond questioning. And if questioning the universe makes me a militant atheist, then I'm proud to be a militant atheist. But as far as talking to people about things, well, I think it, it depends on the audience and it depends on the individual. Sometimes I think one has to provoke and one has to be willing to say that, you know, your ideas are wrong. So I, I think when one's talking to individuals, you have to tell your argument to the individual. Sometimes it's worthwhile being provocative, sometimes even offensive, if necessary, because you're not offending I people, you're offending their ideas. And I think that's what's important, to be that no idea is, a, is beyond reproach. But I think it takes all kinds. I, sometimes it takes humor. I think what one shouldn't be is patronizing. And there are a lot of people who, who have incorrect views about the universe. It doesn't mean they're stupid. It means that they, that they haven't had that discussion before. And I think being willing to enter open discussion fearlessly is important. But it's equally important not to be, not to be overwhelmed or kowtowed by, by, by what people think is, is, is uh, proper. That it's not proper to talk about God, that it's not proper to question God. Surely open questioning and a willingness to try and find the truth is more important than people's feelings. I try not to try describe myself as any ist, except maybe, I suppose, a scientist. Humanism means many things to, uh, to me, and, I, and, and the good aspects of that are that I'm willing to openly question uh, the universe and, and, and follow wherever the universe takes me to answer those questions. The fact that I care about other humans, the fact that I care about humanity, and ultimately want to work with others to try and improve the human condition, that, that uh, I recognize the value of others and the value of ideas. All of those things represent humanism to me, and in that sense, I guess I would be proud to be called a humanist.